office immediately. We have received your test results. Please call your doctor ASAP to discuss the matter. Hey, honey, uh, just so you know, my mom is planning to stay with us an extra two weeks. Welcome aboard, passengers. We'd like to share a special welcome to all the babies on board. No services for 63 miles and the gas gauge just popped on. Fantastic. Hey, um, we need to talk. All right, good morning, how are you doing? Great to see your lovely shining faces. We are gonna have a great day today on this Super Bowl weekend. So glad that you made a point to be here. Um, we'll see how tonight goes at our six o'clock service. We've made, we've made preparations, don't worry. We'll tell you about it later on. It's gonna be great. Hope you have a great time though if you're enjoying the game today and a great time uh, enjoying with people that you get to do life with and get to be an influence in their world. So think about that today as you're processing and just spending good time with them. Great chance to be a world changer. We're so glad you're here with us today. We are in week four of a series that has been very timely for us. Talking about stress, talking about the, the things that kind of cave in in our lives and uh, finding what God says to do about that. So we're just going to push the ball down the field a little farther today and look for what God has in his word for us. I want to welcome you guys here at our Victorville campus. I want to welcome those in Apple Valley and Phelan and Hesperia that are meeting right as we speak and uh, just so excited to see what God's doing all throughout the desert through High Desert Church, through his people. So we're going to continue. If you didn't get a copy of the notes on the way in, raise your hand. We have folks who'd love to get those to you, help you dial in a little bit better. I wanna always remind you, if you're in a small group, obviously, for a lot of our small groups are what we call sermon-based, so those are where your questions are. If you're not in a small group, those are also great, I just said great. That's so awesome. Can we say that together on count of three? One, two, three, great. That's right. It's a great way to, um, to just process and reflect upon the message uh, any given weekend, so just think about that as well. If you have a Bible today, open it to Philippians chapter four. If you have a book Bible, electronic Bible, whatever you may have, a good way to remember where Philippians is once you get past Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, you get to go eat popcorn. I grew up in church, we did these things. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So it's an easy way to find that there in the middle of those short letters that Paul wrote to the churches. So in Philippians four is where we're gonna be and uh, find some good things for us today. You know, the Super Bowl is indeed stressful. Whether your team is playing or not just creates a, a lot of stress in our lives. This is how it happened to me this week. I was reading an article in the newspaper about Deflate Gate, right? Big talk right now. Reading about this article, and, and that triggered a thought in my mind about when I played freshman football. And how when I played freshman football, I had grandiose ideas of one day playing maybe at the college level, getting an athletic scholarship, and, and that didn't happen. And as a result, my parents, though, when they sent me to college, that cost a lot of money. And that triggered the thought about the idea that I have four kids who need to go to college. And then on top of that, I began dwelling upon our family finances. And for the next 15 minutes, I was stressed out. And it's all the Super Bowl's fault. Life was fine. What a great way to start the morning, right? Just all freaked out about how you're going to send four kids to college because of deflate gate. And what we're talking about today is actually that idea of what we do think about, what we allow ourselves to dwell upon. And let me give you a quick review over the last few weeks of where we've been, and that'll make a little more sense of where we're going today. This is what we've said. We've said that stress and worry are often words that are used to describe the same thing, but the truth is they're two very different things. Three weeks ago, Pastor Tom reminded us that worry is sin. It's a choice. Stress is actually biology. It's part of the way that God has built our systems. This is a series about how we can enhance our state of mind and heart by allowing those paired systems to complement, to work together and therefore allow us the chance to live in balance. What a great word we hear from Pastor Tom so often at High Desert Church, to live in balance as God designed us to. 
One thing I really love about this series is how helpful it has been to you personally and me personally, kind of organizing and ordering our lives around what God has given us as great directives of how to live and know his peace. But you have to realize that this series is also amazingly beneficial to you on your mission. Remember, everything we do at High Desert Church is wired around the idea of better preparing you to change your world for Christ. And think about how stress plays itself out in your oikos, in your relational world. That when you are someone who is just consistently a pattern of your life is to be stressed out, is to be in worry mode, that speaks volumes to your oikos who doesn't yet know Jesus and they wonder how great must their God be because they worry he's not gonna take care of them. Conversely, just the opposite is true. When you are going through circumstances and issues in your life that cause the people that you do life with to go, how in the world is this person not completely freaking out? How in the world is this person not completely stalled by worry? And they recognize that you consistently are walking in peace because you know what to do with your worry. That speaks volumes to them about a trustworthy, faithful God that you must know. So this series is propelling both of those ideas, helping you and your own personal lives as you walk with the Lord, but also helping your mission, helping you be the world changer that God has called you to be. So let's look back on the last three weeks. We've seen three key ideas. When you're stressed out, approach your circumstances with joy. Remember that verse, let's see how many of you remember from Pastor Tom, say it with me. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. Good job, that was at least seven of us, that was really good. No, just kidding, you did great. So that idea, that's how we approach our circumstances. The week after that, when you're stressed out, respond in gentleness to others. What, what a great word is that? Because when we're stressed, typically it's, we're very short and we're very terse with other people, but God says, respond in gentleness. And last week, Pastor, Tom, or Pastor Tim did such a great job teaching on prayer. When you're stressed out, pray and know God's unspeakable peace. These are the things that we've learned so far, and today we're adding a fourth element. Rejoice, be gentle towards others, pray, and now today, dwell on the good. Dwell on the good. Look at the verse we're in. We're in Philippians chapter four, verse eight. Paul writes to the church, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I want this verse to permeate through your brain, so I want you to say it with me. Read it out loud, either from this screen or from your own Bible. Let's repeat it together on the count of three. One, two, three. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You see, this verse is entirely concerned with the idea of what we think about, of what we dwell upon, of the ideas that we allow to take up residence in our minds. That's where we're going today and how significant those thoughts are to our ability to walk in the peace that God has prescribed for us. Great, great words. What we're gonna see in your notes, we're gonna close in on this big idea, write this down. God says to intentionally dwell upon things that promote his peace in your life. God says to intentionally dwell upon things that promote his peace in your life. In a sense, this is kind of like a duh kind of statement. But we'll see how hard this is for us to do in our everyday lives. And if we will live by this, we will know God's peace in a, in a new and a fresh and a normative way that we've never known before. As we unpack this truth today in doing so, we're gonna actually talk about two misconceptions that many of us had, at least in practice, when you walked in the door today. Number one, you believed that you can't really control what you think about. And we'll talk about that. Number two, you have not understood yet the incredible significance of your thought life related to your physical well-being, related to your emotional well-being, related to your spiritual well-being. 
I want to see how vital your thoughts are to all the other uh, systems within how God has made you. So let's get to it and see what God has for us. Number one, you are responsible for what you dwell upon. You are responsible for what you dwell upon. We're actually gonna start with the end of verse eight and work our way backwards. What was that last phrase? Think about such things. Think about these things. See, we said a minute ago, many of us really don't believe that we can direct our thoughts, that we can control what we think about. We believe as though our mind is its own boss and we're just along for the ride and just kind of taking us wherever it wants to go. But here's the wild thing I want you to grab because what Paul does at the end of this verse, he uses what we call an imperative verb. And an imperative verb is a verb that you would use to give a command, to give a directive. So very literally, he is commanding us to think about these things. God will not give you a directive you cannot accomplish. In your notes, write this down. God never directs you to do something about that which you are powerless God never gives you a directive to do something that you are powerless to do. You can't control the weather, but God says put on a coat. That's your part in the partnership with God. You don't get to direct the weather, but when it's cold outside, you put a coat on. That's your responsibility. His commands are always consistent with our ability to obey, and God wouldn't tell you to do something unless he was certain that he had wired you to accomplish it. So see this from the very beginning, what God expects and how he's built you. Now, here's some questions to ask ourselves. Does that mean that every fleeting thought I somehow have control over? Does that mean that every daydream idea I have I'm responsible for? Does that mean that even the things that I dream about at night I can control? No, no, and no. And by the way, can I also include, it also means that your husband is not responsible for the bad behavior he has in your dreams. <laughs> I will never understand how I am held responsible by my wife for the horrible things I may do in a dream that she has of me. We have plenty of things we have to work on otherwise. We do need to add the, the, the unreal to that as well. So, so this idea though, that's what we're not talking about today are those thoughts that just come upon your mind and go in and out. We're not talking about the daydream thoughts. We're not talking about the, the even stuff you dream about at night. We're talking about the thoughts that you invite into your mind or that at least you don't turn away. See, even the English word that we're using, the word dwell, Think about the other ways that we use that word in our own English vocabulary. That family lives in that dwelling. The place you take up residence. It's saying that there are things that I allow to come into my mind and live there and put down roots when often those are the same thoughts that I should be giving an eviction notice to and getting out of my head. You have the ability to control these things. So as we look at the specific things that we are directed to dwell upon, just know this. Know this, be encouraged by this. You can do it. God's built you for such a purpose. Number two in your notes, not only are you responsible for what you dwell on, so instead do what? Dwell on good things. Dwell on good things. We'll be very specific in just a moment as to what those good things are. Let me share with you a verse, though, that I found from the Psalms. Psalm chapter 16. Don't turn your Bibles or just read it on the screen. Isn't it great? It says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. That's a, another way of saying, I keep my mind fixated on God. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Look at the benefits that come from that. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices, and my body also will rest secure. By keeping my eyes, by keeping my mind upon the Lord and what he teaches me to dwell upon, look at the amazing benefits that come. I have a heart that is glad, I have a mouth that rejoices, I have a body that can rest. These are all wonderful benefits of allowing, of directing, of, of giving command to our minds of what we're going to think about. I did an exercise this week that was really helpful to me, and I, I think it'll be helpful to you. This week, 
I stop to think about what I think about. Let me show you what I mean. Look at the chart in your notes. These are the things. I want you to take a minute, look over these different categories. I want you to circle the top three things that get airplay in your mind. What are the things that you tend to, day in, day out, week in, week out, dwell upon the most, and I want you to circle them. If there's something not there on the list, write it down under other. But these are the kinds of typical things that we do. We, We dwell upon financial concerns. We dwell upon marriage issues, upon the obedience of our kids or the lack thereof, unmet expectations, reminiscing about the past, things that make you laugh, tasks that need to be done, unresolved relational conflict. conflict. We think about the character of God. We think about how he wants you to live. You think about sex. And by the way, I included it there so you wouldn't have to write it in over here, okay? <laughs> anticipating an upcoming big event or even something like revenge. These are the types of things that we tend to allow to take up residence, to have a place to stay in our minds. Circle the top three, I'll give you a moment, that you find yourself going to most consistently. Now here's what I want you to understand as you look at your list. This is your list. This is what you think about. I'm not telling you what you think about. You're evaluating, you're reflecting, and you're going, this is where the majority of my thoughts go. And simple question, do you see anything on that list that could bring about a lot of stress in your life? I see a ton of things. These are your thoughts, what you allow to take up residence in your mind. They're not all necessarily sinful, But as far as things go that you should be fixated upon, many of them have no place to take up residence in your mind. So instead today, if that was your list, I want you to look at God's list. What does God prescribe as the things that you are to dwell upon? In verse eight, there's eight things that we find. The first, whatever is true. Whatever is true. This is also the Greek word that we translate as genuine or as reliable or trustworthy. This is a powerful word. These are the things rooted in reality. That's what ought to make up the things you and I think about. The things that have a bearing in truth. Not in the world of fears, not in the world of fantasies, but in the world of reality. That's where our thoughts ought to be. And it is so easy to live in those other worlds. The world of fear thinking through, considering every worst case scenario, going to every horrible conclusion that could possibly happen, and even some you make up, living in the world chained by fear. And I don't say that as some detached person who has no idea what that's like. We allowed my son, my 17-year-old, and my daughter, my 14-year-old, to go down to Disneyland together on Friday with their ASB class, with him at the wheel. I had no fears about what was going on while they were in Disneyland. But I knew when they were on the road before and I knew when they were on the road coming home and that's when my palpitations were going much faster than normal. We fear. Every worst case scenario was coming across my mind and it's so easy just to allow those thoughts to stay. And the world of fantasy The huge, huge danger of pornography is that it elicits this idea that this is real. There's this false sense of intimacy, that there's something really here that lasts, that matters, when it's all smoke and mirrors. Completely a world unreal and untrue. God says, don't let your mind dwell upon things that are not true. Instead, stay rooted in reality, a great litmus test question is what you are currently concerned about thinking upon, is it accurate? Is it accurate to what is real? Secondly, what is noble? What is noble, that, that, that is which is worthy of respect. Think about the things, think about the people that you respect, how they earn that respect from you. It's based on the kinds of decisions that they make. It's based on the kind of attitudes that they have. It's based on their quality. These are the things that, that that elicit respect out of your life towards them. The Bible says, think about those things. 
Dwell upon those characteristics. Dwell upon those great admirable qualities and model your life after their nobility. A great litmus test question, is the thing that you're dwelling upon something you should imitate? Is it currently something that you should live out just like that other thing? If it isn't, it has no place in your mind. Dwell on these things. Next, whatever is right. Whatever is right. That Greek word in our text today is the same word consistently translated as righteous. And it's funny, that word righteous is such a word that we don't really know what it means, but we say it a lot in Bible land here at church. For some of you who grew up in the 60s, it was synonymous with smoking weed. It's kind of, I think, how that went. That's not this righteous, okay? This is that righteous idea that's simply a really easy way to remember it is this. That which is right according to God's standards. God is righteous in the way that he lives and responds to everything in his world. We mirror the character of God when we live in ways that are consistent, that are right with his ways. So think on things that are right. The qualities that you recognize in other people's lives that are consistent with God's ways, that's what we're to dwell upon. The way they respond in stressful situations that's what we want to think about. A litmus test question concerning what you're currently dwelling on. Is it consistent with God's ways or not? Next on our list, think on these things. Whatever is pure. Whatever is pure, and that word means exactly what you think it means. That of moral chastity, of purity, of, of modesty and innocence. God says, let your mind go there. Think upon those things. And it, the hard part is, it's nothing that you're going to find on a billboard. It's nothing you're going to find on a magazine cover. It is surely, very likely, something you will not find in a Super Bowl ad today. And here's the simple reason why. Our culture is obsessed with its opposite. Continually feeding us lies that what God has said is not true. What you want is something over here. We so easily buy it hook, line, and sinker. God says, trust me. Trust me that the things that are pure are not only ultimately the things you want, they're the things that bring blessing to your life and they keep your mind in a path of peace. Dwell upon these things. Ask yourself this question. I love this in the notes. Is it something you'd enjoy if Jesus was standing next to you? What a great litmus test question. If the current things that you're dwelling upon in your mind, is it something you would still allow yourself to think about, allow yourself to dwell upon if Jesus was right there next to you having the same thought? Think about these things. Next, whatever is lovely. Whatever is lovely. This is a fascinating word in the original language because it's only found one time in the entire New Testament, right here in Philippians chapter four, verse eight. And the word just simply means that which is visually pleasing. That which you look upon and just, just have a sense of just joy from seeing it. Have we not had some amazing sunsets here in our high desert? You add a few clouds to our already beautiful sky and you get art. You get an amazing canvas that God draws upon. And the hues of pinks and purples and oranges and yellows and reds. God does this amazing, beautiful thing in the sky and we get to thank him for it. We get to praise his artistry. And for all those other beautiful things in creation, go anywhere else but here, okay? And you can find those things too. <laughs> the Bible says think about these things. Isn't it cool that part of the litmus test of what you're dwelling upon, does it brighten your life? Just the pure joy of seeing something beautiful relieves stress and gives you a moment to, to just realize that God indeed is an artist and he's blessed people in ways of producing art that just causes you to go, that just brightens my day, just seeing that, visually appreciating that thing. Think about these things. Next on the list, whatever is admirable. Whatever is admirable, th this is another word only found one time in the New Testament. And it's the idea of the things that you appreciate, that you obviously admire in other people. The qualities that you see demonstrate about those who love God and they love people and you go, man, I, I love seeing that in them. We do a thing sometimes at our birthday parties for our family. 
We don't do it every birthday, but we do it often. And it's what we just call doting, D-O-T-I-N-G. Not dotting, but doting. And it's simply this, taking time to verbally tell someone, especially it may be their birthday, this is what I appreciate about you. This is what I admire about you. So Kendallin, my 12-year-old, at her birthday will say things like, Kendi, what I really admire about you is the way you love to have fun. Kendi, what I appreciate about you is the way that you are such a good friend to your, your group, your friends, your posse. And we'll say things like that. These are qualities that I admire about your behavior. Think on those things. Let your mind dwell there in your notes another litmus test, does it better your reputation? The things that I'm dwelling upon, is that something that promotes a better reputation among people based on me living those out? Think on these things. Next, whatever is excellent. The idea of that of moral goodness or virtue. People that have no deception, this, this sense of trying to work their way through the back door, that guile, you see that and that just absolutely turns you off. This is the opposite of that. That's where someone is genuine. Someone is not hypocrisy in their life. This is someone you go, you are straightforward and I love that. That is excellent. God says, think about such things. A litmus test, does it remind you of how Jesus acted? Jesus offended people left and right when he was here on the planet, but it was never because he was a hypocrite. It was never because he wasn't genuine. He modeled this well for us that excellence in life, and lastly, anything that is praiseworthy. That which we applaud, that's another way of saying the word. What are the things that we applaud? And the right things that we applaud, those kind of qualities, those are things that if we focus on, if we think about, they promote peace in our lives. Can you see this in these eight qualities? Do you see a consistent thread that goes through at least half of them? And that is when you notice qualities in other people that are honoring to God, it's going to change the way you live. When you watch the way that godly men and women handle stress and you begin to think upon, to dwell upon their reactions, guess what? How you think determines how you live. We've told our kids all along, I grew up in a You've heard my story before. I'm a lifer, grew up in a Christian home, went to Christian school up through the eighth grade. And one of the things that was just mandatory was reading biographies of Christian leaders, whether it be missionaries, pastors, just godly men and women, whatever it was. A huge benefit to my life to get to know how they would do it. What did they do when they experienced something like this? So for our kids, our kids go to public school and they get the option almost every year in their English class to pick a book or pick a series of books they would wanna read. So we sit down as a family and we go, man, when you have the option to read something especially for school credit, here are some biographies of godly men and women. I want my kids to have the right heroes. So do you find stories that they would emulate their lives after because it won't just be knowledge, but when that knowledge translates to intentional thought, those are the things we become. That's what God is saying. Think about these things. They will transform the way you live. Now, here's the thing that's important to understand. Every one of these weeks, we're in week four, the earlier three weeks, hear that every week you were never given some formulaic recipe. Just do A plus B, it always equals C. You were given truth from God's word about what to grow in, what habits to begin to live out in your lives, but it wasn't, I'm just gonna sit down and in 10 minutes I got this. Rejoice in the midst of your circumstances wasn't just put on a fake happy face and just keep finding the silver lining in every gray cloud because that'll work for about 20 minutes. But then you're gonna fall flat on your face and you'll think this stuff doesn't really work. Instead, begin to practice a life of joy. When you heard about being gentle towards others when you're stressed out, it wasn't some sort of false compassion that you heard us espouse from the stage that you just try to kind of fake your way through and make other people, like when you're just gonna blow your top instead of wringing their neck, you just say a kind, trite word while it's kind of coming out of your mouth like this. That was never the equation. 
It wasn't a simple, easy fix forever. It was a series of reactions and a series of ways of relating to people. Prayer, you heard it from Tim last week. It wasn't like, man, God, I got these worrisome things. I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna be really dedicated for these next 15 seconds. Are we good? Is God the magic lamp, the genie that if I rub just the right way, I can get him to do what I want him to do? That was never the equation you were given. And just so today, thinking on these things is not, hey, God, I had some really good dedicated thoughts to you for those full 20 minutes. I think I'm pretty good for the rest of my life. It was never to be that. These are habits. These are disciplines that we begin to engage in our lives. This is how we dwell on the good. And the good news that I wanna remind you of, you can do it. God has wired you for the capacity to do this. And that leads us to our third and final point. Make it your habit to dwell on good things. Make it your habit to dwell on good things. Not just that you can control what you think about, not just fill your mind with good things, but do it habitually. Do it as a new norm, as your new nature. I love this verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's in the, con- or 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm sorry. It's in the context of Paul writing about spiritual warfare. And in that context, he says this, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take captive every thought. This verse is another great one that talks about how we can control what we think about, what we dwell upon. And in doing so, we're gonna have a militant self-discipline. I'm not going to allow thoughts that should not be there to remain. I'm going to evict them. And those that need to be there, I'm going to fill my mind with. And that's what we're talking about, developing a habit, developing a new way. Just like the other elements we've been looking at, including rejoicing, including relating with gentleness, including prayer. Dwelling on the good is not simply to be engaged once for all or just when you're stressed out. Some of us will go right to that as our Band-Aid. Think good thoughts, think good thoughts, think good thoughts. You get through this difficult circumstance and you're back to doing what you were doing before. God says, make this your new norm. Make this your habit. Verse eight lists eight qualities. That's kind of cool. It's easy to remember. Verse eight in chapter four of Philippians gives us eight qualities of things that we should be mentally dwelling upon. In your notes, these guardrails are the disciplines required to keep your minds thinking the right things. Of the path that God has lined out for us, the path of peace, these are the guardrails that keep us in the middle where we wanna walk, where God wants us to walk. And like any other type of discipline or another phrase we use are holy habits. Like any other holy habit, the more that you willingly choose to have these kind of thoughts take up residence in your mind, the more and the more they become second nature. The more they become your new way of life. That's why they call it practicing the presence of God. Not just simply living in his presence and just automatically it's there. It's something we put into motion through holy habits of practice. An article was given to me this week. I want to read just a blurb of it to you. It says this. This is the fundamental secret of caring for our souls. Our part in practicing the presence of God is to direct and redirect our minds constantly on him. A new grace-filled habit will replace the former ones as we take intentional steps toward keeping God before us. When we put these things into practice, we had a great conversation with our teaching team this week and they said, Todd, this is all good, but, but how? How are we actually going to retrain our brains and dwell on the good things? So I wanted to give you at least four ideas before we leave today. First off, for the commuter. If you commute up and down the hill, right? Because no one goes up towards Barstow because we don't even know what's up there. But (laughs) going down the hill to Rancho and below, when you're doing that commute, 45 minutes, an hour, whatever it is plus, you have some intentional time you could take advantage of. It is right there in front of you. And you most likely have audio devices that you could use to engage good things, engage the things that you're to dwell upon that God says, fill your mind with these. It's amazingly cool to be able to read the Bible while you're driving with your ears. Not advocating the other, by the way. 
It's a new, new, newfangled uh, technology. They actually have the Bible on audiobook. And for those of you who don't even know what a CD player, you can get it for your iPod too. And, and you can actually download the Bible and just have it read to you verse by verse. 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and 15, one way every day you have that, that time where you are stuck and can't do anything else. Why not occupy the time well? There's podcasts of great communicators of God's word. You could listen to that. You could listen to other audio books of great things about how to live in a way that honors God. Fill your mind, dwell upon these things. For those of us when we're doing work around the house, I love, I love how mopping the floor can become a worship experience. It can do so without music, but music is really helpful. And for so many of you, it's amazing. You come to a weekend worship service. You love to sing. You love the quality of the music. You love the words, the lyrics, the actual music itself. It uplifts you. It emotes an opportunity to respond to God. But it's only one day a week. That could be more of a habit that is going on consistently. You're doing housework and you have on the computer or you have a radio somewhere and you actually, it's, it's amazing. These songs that we sing here are available. There's this new thing called iTunes and you can download songs and listen to them. And guess what's gonna happen? The, the, the music is the music you begin humming throughout the day when the music isn't on. The lyrics that magnify the greatness of God are the sound bites that begin to come out of your mouth and it is a great way to fill your mind with the good things that God says promote his peace in your life. Podcasts, audiobooks in a similar way are available, but man, think of the household chores that get absolutely transformed when your mind is actually thinking about things that promote God's goodness towards you. In times of worry, times of worry when it feels like your life is caving in and the walls are crashing down, how amazing is it to have God's word in your heart and in your mind and you say things to yourself like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. It's right there. And I can call upon it. Whether it be the promises of God or the truths about God's character, you can go there with your mind. Now, some of you would say, well, Todd, only pastors can really memorize the Bible. Well, first off, I memorized that when I was seven. But secondly, you can you just don't have a habit of needing to memorize much of anything today because I don't even know. Someone asked me yesterday, what's your son's phone number? I couldn't even tell him. It was my uncle. He asked me, I don't know. I just look at the Jackson picture, okay? We act as though we don't need to memorize anything, but here's what you can do. There's a new invention called cards, postcards, note cards. You could actually write these things down. You could actually commit them to memory by reading them over and over and again. And until you do, put them in a handy place. Put them on the mirror of your bathroom. Stick them in a book that you're gonna use as a bookmark. Put God's word around you. And then, in the times of worry, that's what can come to your brain. Rather than trying to drop the Bible open and see where it lands and find something helpful already in advance, have it stored. And finally, for temptation, I find that when I'm tempted to sin, this sounds really funny to say this, I often don't have the time to actually recite an entire verse because I'm gonna make a sinful choice before I can get done. So I have sound bites, intentional sound bites that remind me in the moments of temptation, the one that tends to be the most helpful for me is simply this, Jesus is better than whatever is tempting me in the moment. Jesus is better than. Just a reminder, just self-talk that reminds me of the good that I want to dwell in my mind and the evil that I need to evict. So this week, when your paper is open 
and you're reading about deflate gate and you begin to think about when you played freshman football and then you think about how you didn't get a college scholarship but it was really stressful for your parents to pay for you to go to college and then you remember that you have four kids who have to go to college and then you begin stressing out over your family's finances even if you have that crazy pattern of thought that finally gets you to a place where you dwell and you could worry, now it changes because when you get to that place of beginning to worry about your family's finances, you say, but God, look at what you've done for us. Look at your faithfulness. And I look back over the 22 years of our marriage and, our, and raising our kids and I see God show up time after time after time. And all I can say is, God, you are faithful. God, you are faithful. God, you are faithful again and again. Why would you not show up this time? And so instead, following down a path of worry, it can instead turn into an opportunity to praise. That's what happens when we dwell upon the good. This week, fix your thoughts Think about these things that promote God's peace in your life. Walk in his peace this week and watch your relational world take note. Let's pray. Father God, we begin by just saying thank you today for your written word, for your revelation. God, you've revealed yourself to us through creation. You've revealed yourself to us by the moral compass you have put within our hearts. But God, it is your written word that today we thank you for because it, it teaches us, it shows us, it reveals to us how we are to live in a way that not only pleases you, but in a way, God, that brings great blessing and joy to our lives. Thank you that you tell us we can control what we think about and thank you that you tell us what we should think about because we want to walk in your amazing peace. You may be here today and we talk about good things to think on but in reality, you've still not yet made the best decision you need to make and that is coming to terms with your need for a savior. At HGC, we talk about the ABCs, A is admit. Admit that you have lived life on your terms. Admit that you have fallen short of God's directives for your life, not just once, not just twice, but a whole bunch of times. The Bible calls that sin. And every single human being who's ever walked the planet joins those ranks. And the reality is that sinners need a savior. A, admit, not just the idea that, yeah, I'm one of them. Admit your own personal sin. B, believe. Believe that the God-man Jesus, the God-man who saved Paul's life, who wrote this letter, the God-man who saved the lives of those who received this letter at the church of Philippi, believe that that God-man 2,000 years ago, he lived a sinless life. He died a sacrificial death. He was raised supernaturally on the third day. Believe that he is the only savior available. And see, choose. Choose not just to have information about Jesus. Choose to surrender your life. The song we sing today, I lay me down. I lay me down at the altar, Father, and I say, Jesus, forgive me for my sin. I believe that you are the savior who can make this right. I choose to walk in your ways from now on. And the Bible says that when you respond to Jesus that way, that your eternity is sure, that your life will make sense because you'll have purpose and that your sins are forgiven. The great news is you can make that decision before you even get out of your chair today. And I would so plead with you to do so. Father, you are good. Your love endures forever. Thank you for giving us so many great things to know how to live we love you. Help us to live them out this week. And we pray in Jesus' mighty name, amen.